Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. January 2017 marks the 40th anniversary of the groundbreaking television miniseries, Roots. We're joined today by Dr. Wesley Hogan, who is director of the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University, to talk a little bit about the significance of Roots, uh, what it has created going forward 40 years, and also to talk about some of the work at the Center for Documentary Studies, particularly the SNCC Gateway Digital Project. How are you doing today, Wesley? It's great to be with you. I'm very happy to be here and talking about this vital subject. What do you, you remember the first time you watched Roots? Um, what do you remember about that experience? So I was really little, and I remember it was a big deal. Um, my mom had friends over, and um, I got very scared at the opening scene, or the birth scene, mm -hmm. and so she basically scuttled me out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna say it wasn't until college in the late 80s when I went back and got to see it through from beginning to end. It's, you know, I was, probably around your age when I first saw it also. Um, my parents watched it with me. I don't remember them actively encouraging me to watch it, mm. um, but it was what we were watching, and so we just kind of stayed with it. Um, I think, you know, when we were our age, uh, it was hard to measure the significance of that moment. Um, we hear stories all the time about adults, yeah. you know, who went to work the next day. Uh, and the water cooler talk, you know, was about, you know, this family and Kunta Kinte and, and Toby and, and all of these kinds of folks. I don't think anybody imagined at that moment, right? You know, ABC very consciously didn't know what to do with it, <laughs> right? And, and had it go eight nights in a row so they could get it out of the way. Um, yeah. And 40 years later, you know, it, it has stood the test of times in terms of ratings and, and things of that nature. You know, you're trained as a historian. Um, you know, you direct a center that specifically is documenting, yeah. you know, history in very specific kinds of ways. Um, have you been surprised about the longevity in terms of the influence and the legacy of Roots? I think the longevity and also the, until very recently, the lack of uh, films and TV series that develop it further, develop the kinds of subject matter further. So I, I would be fascinated to get an oral history of the ABC executives that were batting this around <laughs> in the fall and um, winter of 76, 77. Um, it was groundbreaking at the time for, set, for a lot of different reasons, and I don't think they expected or knew what to expect from the ratings. So I think the ratings were a big surprise, the Emmys were a big surprise. Um, and they, you know, there, we have some indication that there was a lot of fear on the executives' part. Um, of how to move this through. So like you said, they, you know, they jammed right. it into eight nights and um, over the, I think there was a big snowstorm or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. 77. So, so folks were just kind of stuck in the house. <laughs> like two thirds of the country, right? <laughs> um, but even in California and places where, you know, the client was not a factor, the ratings were just yeah. extraordinarily high. So there was clearly a hunger for it. You know, people lining up to Alex Haley, um, book signings, you know, hundreds of, and then thousands of people um, in the months prior to um, the miniseries coming out. So I think it caught a lot of, you know, um, editors and then TV people by yeah. surprise. And I wish that there had been, you know, more right. in the 80s and 90s. It, you know, the thing that strikes me looking back on it, particularly from the view of, of being a child, um, w when we watch it now, we see all these great actors and actresses yeah. that are in it. Um, and I can remember, you know, I'm thinking, okay, that's Mike Brady as a slave owner, right? right. That's Lou Grant, <laughs> you know, running a ship. Um, right. You know, that's Ben Cartwright. <laughs> you know, all these kind of very popular figures that we knew in a different kind of context in terms of the kind of roles they get, you know, yeah. are, are the A-list folks who are in this miniseries. Um, and so I wonder how conscious even the producers might have been in that context of, of having recognizable figures like that. Um, you know, O.J. Simpson yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is in Roots. I mean, John Amos, you know, who gets fired from yeah. um, Good Times, you know, to take a role, you know, as the adult Kunta Kente, the adult Toby in the film, mm -hmm. right? And, and famously says, 
you know, as he was talking about his firing from, from uh, Good Times, you know, he'd rather play a sla slave on television <laughs> than actually mm. be in one, you know, echoing this comment wow. from, you know, Hattie McDaniels, you know, you know back in the right. 1930s. Yeah. And also just the opening scene, the power of Maya Angelou and Cicely Tyson, right? Yes. With that, I mean, it, it, I think at the, um, when I went back to, to look at it again recently, I think that, that framing shot of yeah. sort of giving birth to this whole new way of thinking about black history, um, the, the ways we think about American history, right. the fact that the, the Brady Bunch dad was, <laughs> was playing this, uh, you know, compared to what we've seen recently, you know, fairly realistic look at how right. does a white person become so compromised, right. and what are the long-term legs of that? I think that for, I don't know, I, I, I have to admit to feeling a sense of, <clears throat> I wish we had been able, uh, culturally, to build on some of these incredible yeah. performances and, and sort of reclaiming of history um, I mean, you think about it now, right? You see a film like 12 Years a Slave, you see a film right. like Selma, you see any of Skip, Skip Gates, you know, serial documentaries on PBS. Um, we're equipped, because there's now an infrastructure around yeah. public television and PBS, we're equipped to take that stuff right into the classroom yeah. the next day, right? You know, they're already thinking about developing curriculum around these things mm -hmm. before anybody even sees them in the public. You know, 1977, that infrastructure is not there. And, and thinking about, you know, K through 12, yeah. coming to school the next day with all these questions about what they saw on television. And most of these teachers, you know, yeah. on some level being ill-equipped to respond to them because, you know, they hadn't taken any African-American history courses. Right. <laughs> You know, right. in their training, um, there's not a whole lot of African American history curriculum, you know, taking right. place in these schools. Um, but yet, we've seen this shift over the last 40 years. I mean, what would you attribute this shift now uh, to? Almost, and, and and of course, you know, nothing is perfect, but there has been a kind of embrace of African American history yes. in the ways that we talk about um, and teach. American history, right? The National yeah. Museum is, is, is evidence of that yeah. shift, right, in the broadest sense of the word. Yeah, and that African American history is central to all American history, right? right? That right. we have to understand it in order to understand the broadest um, and most signal moments in the country's history. So I think that shift, I mean, I would put it at the feet of activists. I think right. there's a lot of um, ways to define activists. So you have the sit-in folks and the people that are part of the Panthers, and you have people who are uh, very early on in, um, um, you know, John Hope Franklin right. insisting on a truthful accounting of U.S. history, uh, not just at the scholarly college level, but also really making sure that in fifth grade uh, U.S. history survey and then in the tenth grade that there are people um, who we're starting to see as expanding the canon of who's a hero in right. the U.S., but then also how do we think about um, the, the nature of the country's founding. So you have people, um, Nathan Huggins, saying how does slavery deform mm -hmm. the American mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. and our founding myths, right, our founding stories. Um, so I think his, the, the deforming mirror of slavery came out in 71. Mm -hmm. And so those people working at a scholarly level and then you know, making sure that it gets to, um, at first, progressive curriculums and you know, experimental K-12 systems, and, and now, you know, we fought for a long time in Virginia to make sure that the fourth grade standards of learning included right. more than, there was 500 questions kids were supposed to prepare on those index cards. Right. And in 2000, there was only two out of the 500 that were African American history, right? So people worked for about a decade to try to reform those statewide standards so that the teachers could include more, and right. I think that happened at a lot of, a lot of local levels as well. You're watching Left of Black, I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here with Dr. Wesley Hogan, who is director of the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University, reflecting on the 40th anniversary of the television miniseries Roots. Y you know, sometimes we're apt, um, and it's almost impossible to think this, but sometimes we forget Alex Haley yeah. <laughs> within this context. Um, the miniseries had had such a dramatic cultural impact yeah. that we forget how much impact the publication of the book Roots had, you know, yeah. just a couple of years earlier, right? I mean, so powerful an impact that someone at ABC thought <laughs> we should turn this into something 
you know, immediately. Yeah. Can you talk about a figure like Alex Haley um, and, and what it meant for him to write a accessible history, right? And we can parse whether or not yeah. he's working as a historian or doing kind of literary nonfiction, right? right. We, we can talk about all those kinds of things if we will, but you know, in terms of him writing this very accessible history, right, that gets serialized, right, in, right. in Reader's Digest, mm -hmm. right, where particularly white Americans are coming to terms with this in language that's accessible, that's not, not necessarily accusatory, right, right that, that allows them, I, I would argue that Haley does, allows white folks to see themselves in the telling of this story. Yeah, so I think Alex Haley is a, a transformative fi figure in the post 45 literary and cultural era. So right. he's a historian and a journalist and a literary stylist whose reach is um, foundational in helping us imagine who we are and who we've right. been. Uh, having said that, he was an outsider, right? So he was for a long time in the Coast Guard and then comes through um, to sort of freelance journalism and it's not until 65 in the autobiography of Malcolm X that he begins to feel like he's got enough cultural weight to really right. think about right. this pet project he's had on the side about you know, what he heard growing up on the porch in Henning, Tennessee with his grandmother and relatives talking about what they remember, where they're from, who's a part of their family, these sort of key stories that he had been so central to his life. Um, which he then, you know, by the fall of 76, is able to um, <clears throat> put together after 20 years of painstakingly right. researching, traveling, and there's wonderful stories about him traveling um, to many different places, being obsessed with the Rosetta Stone in the British Museum, <laughs> trying right. to figure out how he can translate what he knows in his head to the widest possible audience about his family history and what it means for the common story we have as Americans. Um, so when that comes out, I think even he and his publisher are surprised by the, the a nerve that it, it plucks. So people not only begin to think their own family history is worthy of, you know, he's got thousands of letters down in right. Tennessee at the, the archive at University of Tennessee of people writing, how do I do my own family right. genealogy? So he opens up this whole big interest for, for <coughs> hundreds of thousands of Americans. But he also, I think you're right, he gives people a way to connect um, to this being a much broader American story that we all need to think about and come to terms with. Um, I was struck too, and we can circle back to this perhaps, but the more recent roots uh, really short changes when they edit it down to four segments right. instead of eight. Uh, the scenes in, in, the, in the first two episodes of the original roots where you see the sort of compromised nature of um, whites like the captain who start off as being I'm a moral man, I right, won't participate right, in this. Right. And then you see him sort of worn down by his, right. I think, sergeant at arms, um, who says, well, this is the way it is. This is the way we need to do it. And he doesn't fight, you know, it's right. not like a heroic, right. it's not a heroic story. Um, and so I think that's, that's um, an important process to see that it wasn't just black and white, that there were these gradations by which yeah. people's common humanity was uh, where they step back from a sense of a common humanity. It, it, you know, if you're to talk to folks now about why Roots is still important, yeah, um, why it's important to mark this anniversary, um, I think about the work of Matthew Delmont, um, who just wrote a really brilliant book um, that tells the whole backstory, yeah. <laughs> right? The challenges and the struggles. You know, Alex Haley is a working writer, you know, in a country in which it's not that easy to be black <laughs> and a right. working writer, right? And, and he's telling this fantastic story. Um, yeah. and, and at least earlier in his career, no one's interested in it. <laughs> right. right. Um, you know, we, we forget that, you know, he essentially is writing pieces for Playboy. <laughs> right. Interviewing you know, interviews celebrities, with right. Malcolm X, uh, the head of the neo-Nazis. I mean, it's, yeah. it's an interesting kind of moment for him. Um, but if someone's to ask you, particularly someone young, Right, who has access to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Who who can go to YouTube, right? Can you know who can go to anything on PBS, right? You know that tells the story uh, of Black folks in this country. Why is Roots still significant? 
Well, I actually can answer that very clearly <laughs> because we just had this situation where we had a bunch of young people come through the center in September of 2015 who were interested in connecting with elders who'd been a part of the civil rights struggle earlier. And they were, you know, from a wide range of racial and ethnic backgrounds. They were from different parts of the country. And they said, sort of, how can we connect to not only our elders in the struggle, but we don't really have an understanding of why um, the Black Lives Matter movement has emerged now. We don't have an understanding of um, why police are killing young black and brown people. You know, it's very hard for us to, you know, we know you can give us a bibliography, right. but we kind of need right. a, a way to move and to share it with other young people. And I have to say that this is a seminal moment for us to understand the origins of the country. Right? We've got to figure out how we got to 2016 right. and um, the moment that we're in. And a, and a crucial piece of that is this, is this eight hour, you know, this long and, right. and detailed and multi-layered set of stories right. about, you know, how in the hell do we create all men are created equal as our mission statement? And then we have a story like Conte Quinte. Like that is just too hard to square those two things together. And this is a wonderful way, an accessible way, as you said, either in the book or, or particularly in the visual miniseries yeah. to really start to think about where did, you know, I love this quote from Ella Baker, um, that we who believe in freedom cannot rest, right? Yeah. That right. until the killing of black men, black mothers' sons is as important as the killing of white men, yeah. right. white mothers' sons, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Yeah. And if you, it does not make sense to somebody who's 20 years old a day how we get to a spot where we're in in terms right. of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, you know, kids who say, how do we get here? Why is our country like this? Um, and I think this is just, an, uh, uh, but you can't teach it without, yeah. without access to roots. You, you mentioned the role that activists played in terms of the changing and how we talk about the history, right? And, and I think specifically, you know, friends of yours, um, the, the work that Charlie Cobb did, you know, yeah. at NPR, you know, making right. sure that Africa was covered, right, in a legitimate way, right. you know. The work that Judy Richardson did working with Black Side Productions, right, which right. essentially becomes Eyes on the Prize. Um, yeah. The work that you've been doing with that generation, um, talk a little bit about the, the SNCC Gateway digital project and, and just the example you told of being able to bring young folks in conversation with some of the elders. Talk a little bit about that work at the Center for Documentary Studies. Yeah, well, the most important piece of that is that the SNCC people felt like they had enormous informational wealth. Yeah. So they said, you know, we don't have a lot of material wealth, but man, we have some real political experiences. And you, Wesley, and you, Hassan, you guys have gotten us part of the way there with your work, but there's a whole bunch else that we haven't learned. And you know, so Hassan and my face were like. And Hassan <laughs> is. Hassan Jeffries, yeah. who's a professor of history and African American studies at Ohio State. Yep. And so we'd both written on SNCC in the early 2000s, and we kind of thought we'd gotten there and we'd fix some of the literature. And the SNCC people took our books and said, great job, you're only 30% of the way there. <laughs> <laughs> and so. Uh, in the course of doing that research, we had both received an 80-page, single-space document called Slander Panderers, which was from a SNCC veteran who'd gone through all the scholarly literature before us and had noted, like, on page 26 of this book, this was wrong. Wow. On page 94 of this book, this was wrong. And so there were fact, factual errors and interpretive right. uh, choices. And so... We tried to create a framework by which we could have activists on equal par and equal power With the scholars. to scholars right. in making the history. And so the SNCC Digital Gateway is sort of a, a jumping off point. It's an experimental documentary website where Judy Richardson and Charlie Cobb are in fact the central editors of the content. So they're shaping not only um, what documents, film strips, um, film clips, and ephemera are on the site, but shaping the through line narrative of it. So I can keep talking about that <laughs> or not, but, but some of the exciting pieces that we've created is um, a scholarly corner for activists where they can talk back to the literature that's been written yeah. and talk forward to young people who are active today. So we had Umi Salah from the Dream Defenders. We had a lot of people from um, Black Lives Matter 
and we had some people from BYP 100 who came to this conference in September of six, uh, 2016, 20, I'm sorry, 2015, and the purpose of the gathering was about 250 people, was to bring together young people who are active in the immigrants' rights movement and Black Lives Matter, in the GLBTQ movement, um, and to learn from the mistakes, the successes, yeah. the ways of organizing that SNCC and core people had used in the 60s. Interestingly enough, um, particularly given your own work, one of the first flashpoints between the two groups was around the use of Twitter. Right? So there was a person from the generation of elders who said, is face-to-face -face organizing losing out in the Twitter era? Right. And Charlene Carruthers made a really interesting set of points around how important both were. So it wasn't either or, it was a both and, and that these new channels of communication have been crucial to the organizing today. So I think uh, after the fact, we had a lot of people, both old and young, coming and saying, we need more of these. We need more sites where we can gather. And so we've been trying to figure out how we might be able to provide more of those spaces right. around Both the country. in the virtual world and, and also right, right. in the real world. Yeah. We've been joined today by Dr. Wesley Hogan, who is Director of the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University. Thanks for joining us and coming through, Wesley. Thanks, man. It's been great to be here. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything. Everything black. Culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back.